And today I want to talk about what is not on the guidelines, uh, in particularly how do we treat the non-index patient, and is there a sling that is better than the others? You know, do we have efficacy or other data to show that um, really the guidelines sort of shied away from this discussion? So prior to 1996, the majority of surgeries we were doing were needle suspensions and pleovaginal slings. And if you look at a particular series, some results were actually quite good and some were quite poor. The main issue was with morbidity and convalescence and really very a lot of difficulty replicating outcomes. So in some surgeon hands, these surgeries were good and when people went to do them in other places, they couldn't replicate those outcomes. In 1990, the integral theory came along um, that showed that the urethra, well, it was really a theory that proposed that the urethra is fixed in the midline and the pubic bone, and that there's a backboard to the urethra that gives it support, and that this is important in the continence mechanism. And in 1996, the TBT was introduced and really changed uh, our whole paradigm for the treatment of stress incontinence, and it was felt that uh, these mid urethra slings are applicable for the majority of women. As you know, this led to a number of slings being de developed, obturator and retropubic, with different entrance points from down to up, up to down, in, out, out to in, as well as the mini sling. This slide shows what happened to the FDA regulatory approval. Um, the black columns are what happens to slings year after year, how um, in 2002, 2003, almost eight new uh, kits were uh, approved by the FDA and it was really an explosion of, of slings. This study was presented at the AUA in 2014. Unfortunately, I haven't seen it published. I'm actually gonna ask the author, since he works with me, why this hasn't been published. But um, this looks at our surgeries, um, just overall, women who were treated overall, uh, this is database uh, 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 studies, and this is looking at, at the number of surgeries we were doing prior to the FDA notification. So you can see that there was an increase from 2007 to 2010, and right after the notification, we started uh, treating less women, and this is both with mesh and without mesh. And this parallels in sling surgeries, and the reason I like putting this slide on is that this, uh, every time I look at this, and there are a number of studies that have looked at this, so we saw that there was about a 44% decrease just after the FDA notification. <laughs> So it tells me that there, are in, in terms of health uh, disparities, there are either a lot of women out there that we're not treating, and either we're not treating them because they're scared, we're not treating them because we are scared, or we were treating a lot of women who didn't need to be treated, which also opens a whole can of worms, like why were we treating all these women when we thought there was no issues with these slings? Um, in any event, it's something that we really need to pay attention to because this trend has continued where less and less women are being treated currently than they were, I would say, seven years ago. This um, is a study that was published in 2016, and this uh, is eight centers um, of female public medicine and reconstruction, academic centers, all academic centers, and they put their data together <laughs> as to the percent of pleovaginal sling, autologous pleovaginal slings that they're doing. As you can see, there's a trend to do more and more pleovaginal slings. So we're kind of going full circle back to where we were in 1960s with, when this was introduced. Um, by 2013, about 36% of these academic centers were, of slings were pleovaginal slings, and I would argue that this is, is up to about 50%. In my practice, it's about 50%. Um, and the number 